Hey, this is Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring, and we're going to go through the highest yield hemonc concepts that you'll see on your USMLE Step 2 CK, but also on your internal medicine and family medicine shelf exam. I'm most active on Twitter, and that's action underscore AP if you want to follow. Here's our rest of our contacts. Otherwise, let's dive right in. So before we get started, just as a quick heads up, I'm going to cover two things that I have only seen my mentees that score over 265 on the USMLE know for their exam. And I'm also going to include a test taking tip at the very end. So follow, subscribe, give the video a like, and let's get it going. All right, number one, somebody comes in with a trauma and you get coag studies. So you get their PT INR levels and their PTT and they're all elevated. What's your diagnosis? You're going to go for DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And so this is basically widespread activation of your entire clotting cascade and you burn through all your coagulation factors and your platelet. And so the easiest way on the test to clue yourself into DIC is to look for oozing at any puncture site. So you check the patient's IV and there's just blood oozing out around it. That's a buzz phrase that the NDME loves putting on there for DIC. And so another question is, will D-dimer be elevated in DIC? And so the answer is yes. So you basically break down all those fibrin split products and you're going to have low levels of fibrinogen as a result. So all the fibrinogen breaks up into fibrin split products. So the split products go up, the fibrinogen goes down. And keep in mind that you will see this finding in pulmonary emboli. Next, what would you expect your LDH, your lactate dehydrogenase, and your haptoglobin levels to be with DIC? Well, think of DIC essentially as hemolysis, right? And so anytime you have hemolysis, there's generally going to be elevated LDH and a decreased haptoglobin. So a mnemonic I like to remember is haptoglobin, meaning that it's low. And so haptoglobin is low, LDH is going to be elevated. All right, so the summary of DIC is you're going to have an increased PTINR, increased PTT, increased LDH, increased D-dimer, and an increased bleeding time. On the other hand, you're going to have a decreased haptoglobin fibrinogen, and platelets because you're chewing them all up. All right. What are the most common causes of DIC? You have to know these because oftentimes it's the only clue that the question stem will give you besides the labs. Number one is trauma, like the example that we had. Number two is sepsis. You see this all the time in the ICU. Number three is pancreatitis. All those enzymes basically seep out and activate the entire clotting cascade. Cancer can cause it in rare instances, and then toxins can also cause it. So if I had to put my money on three that you need to know for DIC, trauma, sepsis, pancreatitis. All right, next, moving on from DIC, we're going to move on to multiple myeloma. So a patient that has low back pain, hypercalcemia, fatigue, and anemia with a hematocrit usually less than 30%, as well as CKD with creatinine over 1.5 on most questions. That's going to be multiple myeloma. So you probably remember from step one, the CRAB mnemonic, C-R-A-B. So... C for hypercalcemia, R for renal disease with a creatinine usually over 1.5, A for anemia with a hematocrit usually less than 30, and then B for bone pain. So this presents oftentimes as low back pain. All right, so that's the basics. We're going to dive deep into this. So oftentimes they can give you the symptoms of the things that are associated with multiple myeloma rather than just giving you the labs of hypercalcemia, for example. So you need to know what hypercalcemia presents as. The mnemonic is stones, groans, moans, and bones. So kidney stones, abdominal groans, psychiatric moans, slash disturbances, and then bone issues. So the treatment for hypercalcemia. There's a couple of different algorithms. It's going to depend on if you're treating hypercalcemia due to multiple myeloma or hypercalcemia due to a malignancy associated with PTHRP elevated. But the general overarching theme for treating hypercalcemia is number one, Normal saline hydration. So you basically are going to give them 0.9% sodium chloride and blast them with that. And generally, a lot of the algorithms start you at 300 cc's per hour of normal saline. Number two, if the patient is getting fluid overloaded from the normal saline, you give them a loop diuretic. Because remember, loops lose calcium. That's the mnemonic from step one. Comes back to help you here for step two. So loops lose calcium. So you give them furosemide. Number three, you can give them bisphosphonates, such as zoledronic acid. Number four, calcitonin can be used. You can give them an IV infusion of calcitonin. It works quickly, but it's very erratic and it's not as predictable at lowering calcium levels. 
And then number five, if everything else has failed, you can give them dialysis. And remember, the mnemonic for dialysis is K-E-I-O-U. E for electrolyte disturbances is one of the indications for dialysis. So just to recap for the dialysis indications, A for acidosis, E for electrolyte abnormalities that are refractory to medical treatment, I for intoxication, O for fluid overload, and then U for uremia. All right, next, how can the NBME ask you a next step type of question with hypercalcemia? So let's say the patient has a calcium over 12 on their labs. What's the next test to order? You want to get a serum PTH level. This is tested all the time. So you see calcium above 12, next step, serum PTH. So what if the serum PTH is elevated? Then what's the next step? So this is now a third order question they can ask you. And they will be looking for a urine calcium level. And that can be used to rule out familial hypocalciuric hypoparathyroidism. And so remember, it says hypocalciuric. So there's going to be low calcium in the urine if they have FHH. All right, so it goes calcium, then get a PTH, then get a urine calcium level. Next. So let's take hypercalcemia a step further. What else could you see with hypercalcemia besides myeloma? Well, one of the things that I want to hammer in is squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. You'll see elevated PTHRP, that's parathyroid hormone releasing peptide. And this will present with hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. Because remember, PTH stands for phosphate trashing hormone. So you're going to trash all your phosphate and you'll have high calcium but low phosphate. Next, back to multiple myeloma. You have to know this image right here. This is tested all the time. This is going to be rouleau formation. So you see the stack of red blood cells here. This is a key finding on your peripheral smear for multiple myeloma. Next, what is the definitive diagnostic step for multiple myeloma? Well, it's a bone marrow biopsy. As you see here, everything for diagnostic workup is in orange. All of the treatments themselves are going to be highlighted yellow. So you do a bone marrow biopsy. What will it show for multiple myeloma? It's going to show over 10% clonal plasma cells. And something that a lot of students forget is about MGUS. And so MGUS is going to have less than 10% clonal plasma cells. But once it breaks above 10, you're starting to think multiple myeloma. And so just another TQ to keep in the back of your mind is that multiple myeloma might also mention clock face chromatin pattern. Okay. So now we're going to get into some very high level questions about multiple myeloma. This is something that is 260, 265 and above level reasoning for your USMLE. And so most people think, oh, let me just check to look for the Bence Jones proteins in the urine. But keep in mind, a urinalysis, urine dipstick could be negative and may not show the Bence Jones proteins because the urine dipstick really only detects albumin, which is negatively charged, and it will not see the light chains, which are positively charged. So don't be fooled by that. If you see a urinalysis that's negative for protein, that does not rule out multiple myeloma. All right, so let's talk about how to treat multiple myeloma. There's many algorithms that are way beyond the scope of this video, as well as beyond the scope of your step two exam. But there are some things that you have to know. Number one, you need to be familiar with bortezomib. It's a proteasome inhibitor. I literally got a test question on this. Number two, melphalan is another treatment. And then number three, lenalidomide is another treatment. So bortezomib is the one I've seen tested, but also you'll see melphalan and lenalidomide show up on your NBMEs as uh, answer choice explanations. So something that can be tested for your shelf exams is that every single patient on uh, with multiple myeloma should be on bisphosphonates. And so this is a good next step in management. They may ask you, what else should this patient be on or what should you start them on when they are diagnosed with multiple myeloma? Well, you want to start them on a bisphosphonate. And so even if their bones are completely normal on their imaging, you still start them on bisphosphonate. And the big black box warning is osteonecrosis of the jaw in patients that are on bisphosphonates. So that can be tested as well. Every single patient with multiple myeloma should be worked up for a possible stem cell transplant as that's basically like the definitive treatment for it. All right, we're going to take it to the next level here. Bonus TQ on Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. Remember, this has none of the crab symptoms that we talked about with multiple myeloma. This is absolutely loved by the NBME. 70 to 80% of students generally are not going to know all this stuff about Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So it's an over 10% IgM gammopathy. So I remember the W for Waldenstrom upside down is an M. So it's an IgM gammopathy. It's going to have peripheral neuropathy in a glove and stocking pattern. 
and all your symptoms are essentially due to hyperviscosity. So think of your IgMs, they form pentads together. And when those pentads together are running through your blood vessels and running through your system, they're basically scraping everything as it goes. And so it's going to scrape up the blood vessels supplying your peripheral nerves, so you get neuropathy. It's going to scrape up the blood vessels going to your brain. It's going to cause headaches. It's going to scrape up your retinal vessels. It's going to cause visual impairment. This is all due to hyperviscosity. And so the treatment is going to be rituximab. And that's a CD20 inhibitor that can stop your plasma cell differentiation. All right. So let's envision a next step USMLE test question on this. This is going to be third level thinking here. So the patient is on rituximab for Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. What are they at an increased risk for? The NBME is going to be looking for JC virus infection causing progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So I know that that's a throwback way back to step one, but you do need to know this for your step two CK as well as for your shelf exams. Rituximab puts you at increased risk of JC virus, which can cause PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. All right, that's your multiple myeloma crash course covered multiple myeloma, a little bit on MGUS, which has less than 10% clonal plasma cells, and then Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. Next, we're going to cover neuroblastoma and opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. So this is generally a one to three-year-old. They have truncal ataxia, opsoclonus myoclonus, irritability and developmental regression, and an adrenal mass that crosses the midline of their abdomen. That's key, as you're going to see. These patients also will present with diastolic hypertension due to the catecholamine metabolites found in their serum and urine. So I know that that's a lot. So let's go real slow over all this. The most common cause of an adrenal mass is going to be a neuroblastoma in a child. Opsoclonus is saccadic eye movements that are basically jumping. Myoclonus is going to be involuntary muscular twitching. And other diastolic hypertension causes are renal artery stenosis, which you're not going to see as commonly in a one to three year old. It's generally going to be somebody that is much older, like in their 60s and 70s, with severe atherosclerotic or coronary artery disease risk factors. Or it's going to be a younger patient that's generally a female that has fibromuscular dysplasia. The other cause of diastolic hypertension can be catecholamines, such as in this neuroblastoma patient that has the opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. So recall way back to step one, neuroblastoma is going to be an MYCN oncogene overamplification. All right. So we talked about how neuroblastoma is going to cross the midline. Well, what tumor does not cross the midline? And you need to know that it's a Wilms tumor, aka a nephroblastoma. And so how I remember this and keep this straight is I envision the tumor is stuck into the kidney in a one to four year old with Wilms tumor. So it's not going anywhere. It's not crossing the midline. It's only stuck in your kidney. And so the treatment for a Wilms tumor, or aka a nephroblastoma, is a nephrectomy. So it kind of makes sense. It's in the kidney, take out the kidney. You also can give these patients chemo on top of that. And so the management, which is generally how that they'll ask you in pediatrics or your family medicine shelf, they'll ask you, what's the next step in management of these patients? Well, you want to screen for recurrence with abdominal ultrasounds every three months. Have to know that. All right, you maybe have heard of Wager syndrome, W-A-G-R. So this stands for Wilms tumor, aniridia, genitourinary anomaly, and retardation. So you're going to essentially look for a two or three year old that has developmental delays. Their eyes look like this picture, aniridia, and they're going to have a unilateral abdominal mass. Remember, the Wilms tumor is a nephroblastoma and it's stuck in your kidney. So it's not going anywhere and it's unilateral. That's your wager syndrome. The way that they ask this is they'll say, what else would this patient have? And so they'll say a patient has uh, unilateral abdominal mass. They'll have a general urinary anomalies. And they'll say, what else did the patient have? And you'd be looking for aniridia in the question stem or in the answer choices. All right. So what about Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome? So this is also another Wilms tumor syndrome. And so these patients will have abdominal wall defects or hernias. And everything else is going to be wide. So I remember it's called Beckman-Wiedemann syndrome. And so it's going to be hemihyperplasia, half your body is hypertrophied, organomegaly, and macroglossia. You have a big tongue. And so infants will oftentimes present with hypoglycemia as a clue on the USMLE. And so how could they ask this? They'll say, infant presents, their glucose is 40. They have hemihyperplasia. What else may they have? 
And so you could say unilateral abdominal mass, okay, the Wilms tumor, or you could say abdominal wall defects or hernias. All those are fair game. So that's Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. All right. Now I'm going to make it tricky on you here. I want you to make the diagnosis for the 62 year old male based purely off the labs. He's going to have a decreased leukocyte alkaline phosphatase and increased white blood cell precursors, specifically the myeloid lineage, if they give you that. Number two, they have elevated white blood cells, usually over 40,000. Let's say it's 47,000 white blood cell count. Their platelets are usually over 500,000, so let's say 600,000. And basophilia. And so this does not have to be given in the question stem, but it's really good to know. So that should be cluing you into CML. So some of the dead giveaways for CML M stands for a middle-aged person, so they're like 60 years old. They're going to have minimal leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. This is really high yield, which we're going to dive into in a second. And then basophilia, if you see that, CML should be at the top of your differential. They test that a lot, but they do not have to give you the basophilia to clue you into CML. How do you treat CML? Number one is going to be imatinib. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Some of the other ones that are a little, lo, little lower yield are nilotinib and desatinib. Desatinib is used more if they're in the blast phase. And then the only way to actually cure CML is a stem cell transplant. So what are two things that really only 265 and higher scores would know? Number one is leukostasis. I personally do not even remember learning this for the USMLE. It's something that I only learned after tutoring this content and going through all the MBMEs and going way back to some of the old forms. So leukostasis is seen in hyperleukocytosis conditions, and it's going to lead to end organ dysfunction due to occlusion of all those capillaries by non-distensible tumor cells. So you see this in AML and ALL, but not CML. So leukostasis, you want to look for the leukemias that start with an A, so the acute phase ones, AML and ALL, but not CML. And the next is agnogenic myeloid metaplasia, and that's a mouthful. But the other name for that is primary myelofibrosis. You may remember this from your step one birth date book, primary myelofibrosis. It shows it in there, but it does not give the other name of agnogenic myeloid metaplasia. And that's what I see them using on NVMEs for step two. And so this is the least common myeloproliferative disorder, but these patients will have an elevated leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. This is the exact opposite of CML. And so what else has an elevated leukocyte alkaline phosphatase? Well, you're going to see that with leukemoid reactions. And so leukemoid reaction is basically just a stress response to a horrible infection in most cases. And so the symptoms of the leukemoid reaction can mimic the CML. So you can differentiate based upon the leukocyte alkaline phosphatase level. So it's low in CML and it's elevated in leukemoid reaction as well as primary myelofibrosis. And so leukemoid reaction generally is going to have a white count that's like over 50,000. That does not clue it away from being CML because CML can have a super high white blood cell count as well. So you have to look at the LAP, the LAP. So in summary, a low leukocyte alkaline phosphatase is going to be seen in CML, but I've also seen in one question that they give it to you as low in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And so this has to do with deficient DAF that doesn't anchor the phosphatidyl inositol and the leukocyte alkaline phosphatase to the cell membrane. So it ends up being lower because it's lost in the urine. So most important thing to know is going to be low is going to be with CML. Elevated will be with the leukemoid reaction or primary myelofibrosis. All right. You can also see it with elevated levels in polycythemia vera or essential thrombocytosis, basically pathologies with mature white blood cells. But the most commonly tested is going to be that primary myelofibrosis or the leukemoid reaction. And so the last tip I want to give you guys for these crazy hemoc questions, you want to rely on what you know. If you've never heard of stuff like leukostasis or agnogenic myeloid metaplasia, don't just pick that because it looks like a zebra diagnosis. Chances are the NBME is going to test you nine out of 10 times more on stuff like AML, CML, rather than some of these other crazy diagnoses. So go with what you know and make sure that your answer choices rule in and rule out the opposing answer choices to the best of your ability. But if you have three facts that clue you towards CML, and you're not sure about the fourth one, that means CML is still a better bet statistically than an answer choice that you've never even heard of. So keep that in mind. Let me know if you have any questions. Like the video, subscribe, and we'll drop some more soon.